It's a fair bet we'll only beat the coronavirus once most of the globe is immunized. Dozens of countries have started vaccinating, but hundreds are yet to begin. The slow and bumpy rollout will only allow the disease to continue circulating and delay hopes of eradication. New variants of COVID-19 could also erase progress. Will the world get its act together fast enough? Well, Israel is way ahead in vaccinating its people, over three and a half million and counting. The Palestinians have a longer wait, another case of inequality. More on that topic with a doctor in a moment. First, this report from DW's Tanya Kramer. Nurse Mali Michaeli and her team work almost around the clock to administer the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine here in Bat Yam, a town south of Tel Aviv. About 150,000 people are being vaccinated daily throughout the country. <laughs> I really believe in this vaccine. I also got it, and this week I'll get the second dose. We didn't have, thank God, any allergic reactions. It's like a flu shot. It is a very gentle vaccine. It's good. The cultural center turned makeshift vaccination point is run by Klalit, one of Israel's four health management organizations, which provide care through their own clinics. As every citizen has to be registered with an HMO, using the highly digitalized infrastructure has proven decisive for the fast rollout. First priority were people over the age of 60, healthcare workers and people with underlying health conditions. Now it is the turn of the over 50s. It's great, I didn't even feel the shot. I work as a special needs teacher and we are all kind of in the line of fire. It's an absolute must to be vaccinated. Younger people are also called up to receive surplus doses of the vaccine, which would otherwise be wasted. The early purchase of the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine by the government has contributed to this speedy immunization campaign. However, coronavirus infection rates are still high, and the government tightened the country's third lockdown once again last week. The one challenge is vaccinating and, and earning enough time so the vaccines will start to work. And on the other end, we have the third, the third wave in Israel, which has been rising, and a huge number of uh, severely sick people hospitalized in the hospitals. Ramallah in the Israeli-occupied West Bank, a COVID-19 testing center. Infections remain high as well, but here people will have to wait to receive their vaccines. Israel has not been supplying vaccines to the occupied territories. The Palestinian Authority announced this week that it has signed deals with four companies to secure vaccines, among them also the Russian-developed vaccine Sputnik. In the news they say it is not yet approved and they want to give it to us. We don't know what will happen. But at the end we hope that we will get the appropriate vaccine and we will be done with this crisis. We want all of us to take it to feel psychologically at ease because we are in a constant state of worry. And they will have other options. Palestinians have also signed up to the COVAX program, which aims to help low-income countries to get a fair share of vaccines for around 20 percent of their population. Esti Garrity is chief medical officer at Esri, a software company that offers mapping and analytics in the U.S. How vital is a concerted global drive in vaccinating the world and stopping this pandemic? It's incredibly important. There's actually a slogan in global health that says, no one is safe until everyone is safe. And this is really an indication of our highly mobile and highly interconnected world, recognizing that we depend on international trade and we have travel patterns. And if we want to get back to those pre-COVID travel patterns and avoid an unrelenting progression of the pandemic, the vaccine is our best hope. And we can't look at it as individual countries. We need to do it in a global way.
We, we need to, Esty, but th there is so much inequality in the world. And in this case, the, the inequity is so clear, be it the Palestinians, Africans, the super rich paying to, to jump the queue. Um, how can we change that? Well, I personally think that uh, taking a geographic approach is one way to really hone in on these problem areas that aren't getting the resources. Because when you look at this geographically, you can spot those inequities and you can start to do things about it. So there are, of course, uh, organizations around the world from Gavi uh, managing COVAX in coordination with the World Health Organization that are using geography to really uh, try to equalize what's going on. How exactly are they doing that? Can you just explain to our viewers what, what all that means? Sure. Uh, what they're doing is they're creating, of course, the plans. They're called micro plans, really looking at places on that, uh, in a way, microscopic level when you're sort of thinking about the globe. And they're figuring out how we can look at the populations and their access to vaccine and then provide resources in the places where there's not adequate access. Um, and it tells you a lot about how much vaccine should you order for different places when you understand where the population is and where the vaccine uh, distribution sites are proposed or already in place. So I guess that also applies to uh, w within countries, but, uh, the difference between cities and, and the countryside or remote areas, for example. Absolutely. So geography is particularly helpful with that because you can look at things like uh, high risk populations and what their level of accessibility is, whether you're measuring that as, say, a 30 minute drive time or in some places, it's more likely that people are going to be walking or taking public transportation. So you can really define what kind of access that local population will need. And then when you identify where you have gaps in access, you can start to make different plans. Those different plans might be a drive through vaccination clinic or working with independent pharmacies or fire stations or schools or uh, other community locations that can serve the local population. You can also do things like uh, create mobile outreach and optimize the routes of uh, maybe a mobile van to vaccinate uh, highly rural populations or folks who are unlikely to come to a clinic to get their vaccine. But even if you identify those gaps, um is there going to be enough vaccine for everybody? Well, I think the answer to that is absolutely yes. But a more poignant question, perhaps, is how long is it going to take? And the estimates right now are that through 2021, there should be about 2 billion doses of vaccine made available to the world. So since most of the vaccines require two shots to be a full series, that means about a billion people can be vaccinated in 2021. Well, that only represents about 13% of the world's population. So I think this is going to take several years to accomplish. But yes, ultimately, there will be enough. And, and once everyone's vaccinated, will that mean the coronavirus has been eradicated? Uh, well, we would hope so, but I don't think so. So it's the vaccine basically stimulates your body to create an immune response. And that immune response has a memory so that when you're ultimately exposed to the vaccine, mm -hmm. you can fight it more quickly and effectively. But that memory fades over time. And current predictions say, you know, if we're lucky, two to three years of protection, but more likely we'll need an annual booster to kind of remind our immune system what it's supposed to be fighting. OK, we'll have to leave it there. Esty Garrity, thank you very much. Good talking to you. My pleasure. Thank you. And now it's your turn to ask the questions. Our science correspondent Derek Williams has been looking into the topics you've been posting on our YouTube channel. If you contract the virus after the first shot in a two-shot vaccine, do you still need the booster shot? This turned out to be a really tricky question because it's so specific and, and different types of vaccines uh, work 
in different ways. Uh, to zero in on an answer, though, it makes sense to start with something general. Um, what vaccines do, which is to provoke an immune response. Vaccines basically kickstart that process by faking an infection, but it takes time for the body to get up to speed and start making the right defensive cells to fight off the intruder. Trials with vaccines approved in the US and the EU, for example, have shown that the first jab does provide some protection against developing symptoms of COVID-19 if you're exposed, but it takes more than 10 days to get there. And, and it's only around 50% effective, uh, much less than when boosted by the second shot, given the specified few weeks after the first one. So here's the scenario you describe. You got the first shot of your vaccination, and then you were exposed to COVID-19, say a day or two later, and ended up with symptomatic disease because your immune system hadn't ramped up the response yet. The Centers for Disease Control in the US says that if that's the case, it's important to defer your second shot until you've recovered. So I assume that means even if that takes longer than the window of time recommended between the first shot and the booster. The few other sources I could find on this specific question recommended definitely getting the booster shot once you've recovered anyway, as the expectation is um, it'll do no harm and will likely actually strengthen your immune response to the coronavirus if you encounter it again in the future. 